Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Pat O'Brien, George Murphy, and Ruth Hussey in The Navy Comes Through. And as our special guest this evening, Lieutenant Francis Rich of The Waves. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The lifeline of the United Nations is a string of plodding ships that carry the weapons of war across the brilliant blue of the Pacific and through the murky fog of the North Atlantic. The ships of the Merchant Marine. A torpedo strikes and a gallant vessel may go down, but the submarine that murdered her may die too because the Merchant Marine has fangs of its own. And tonight's play, The Navy Comes Through, is the story of the deadly stingers on those merchant ships, the Navy gun crews, who strike back at the wolf packs of the sea. RKO made the picture, and tonight we have Pat O'Brien and George Murphy from the original cast, co-starring with the lovely Ruth Hussey. Pat O'Brien has just finished Bombardier at RKO. George Murphy's current assignment is Batan at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. And Ruth Hussey has just starred in Tennessee Johnson at the same studio. Like the real trooper she is, Ruth stepped into the breach at the last minute to take Joan Bennett's place this evening. As you probably read in today's newspaper, Joan's house burned down last night. She had a rather narrow escape, and the doctor has ordered her to stay in bed for a few days. A lot of activity goes on behind the scenes here in the Lux Radio Theater before one of these productions is ready for the microphone. First, we must secure the right stars, the kind we have tonight. And then comes hour after hour of rehearsal. But the power behind all that activity is you. You make all these plays possible by buying Lux Flakes. And you can't lose because our product has proved its worth. And as a bonus, your whole family as reserved seats in the Lux Radio Theater. We always hope for a favorable verdict on our plays. We know we'll get one on Lux Flakes. And here's the curtain for the first act of The Navy Comes Through, starring George Murphy as Tom Sands, Ruth Hussey as Myra Mallory, and Pat O'Brien as Mike Mallory. Like huge black ghosts, they slip from their moorings in the dead of night and turn their bows to the open sea. Slowly they move, wallowing deep in the heavy waves. For these are the ships of the merchant marine, and their great bellies are swollen with the instruments of war. Food for the people of the world, and food for the guns of the United Nations. Here below are stored tanks and planes, Shells and bombs, oil and TNT. While above on the decks face the men of the United States Navy, watchdogs of the convoy, scanning the dark sea for the telltale ripple of the U-boat's periscope. They're short on gold braid, these men who sail with the merchant marine, but they're long on courage. But pacing the decks, they walk on dynamite. One of these men is Michael Mallory, chief gunner's mate, United States Navy. I guess it's all right to tell this story. Nowadays, you can pick up a newspaper and read stuff like it most every day. You know, convoy reported attacked, a U-boat reported sunk in North Atlantic, stuff like that. Well, the fellows I work with are the fellows who do the reporting and the fighting, so we know it from the inside. However, the beginning of the story, you find only in the Navy records. That was back in September 1940, down in Washington, D.C., I was in Washington at the time. The Navy Court of Inquiry was in session. And they called me as a witness. The Court of Inquiry, that's... Well, you know, that's just like a civil court, only the judge and the jury down there in the United States Navy. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. State your name, rate, and station. Michael Mallory, Chief Gunner's Mate, Temporary Duty, Navy Department. You were on duty aboard the USS Bayonne on April 9th, 1940, when a gun exploded in the forward turret? Yes, sir. 
You inspected this particular gun prior to the target practice, which led to the explosion? I examined the gun at 10.20 a.m., two hours and 40 minutes before target practice. Was it in good condition? No, sir. I found the salvo latch improperly assembled. To whom did you report this? The assistant gunnery officer. Who was that officer? Lieutenant Thomas Sands, sir. Did Mr. Sands have the salvo latch repaired? I don't know, sir. He said he'd attend to it, but the explosion occurred on the first salvo. Confine your testimony to the facts, Mallory, and avoid conclusions. Aye, aye, sir. Mr. Sands, do you have any questions? No questions, sir. Very good, Mallory. That's all. Aye, aye, sir. Lieutenant Sands, will you take the stand? <laughs> you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. State your name, rank, and station. Thomas L. Sands, Lieutenant United States Navy, temporary duty Navy Department, sir. You were assistant gunnery officer on the ship in question at the time mentioned? I was, sir. Did Chief Gunner's mate Mallory report to you the condition of the salvo latch on one of the guns in the forward turret? Yes, sir. What action did you take? I ordered the turret captain to repair the salvo latch, sir. Did he do so? Yes, sir. I supervised the repairs personally. Then how do you account for the fact that this particular gun backfired on the first salvo, causing an explosion in the turret? I can't account for it, sir. Is there anyone who can corroborate your statement that you had that salvo latch repaired? No, sir. Why not? The men who repaired it are dead. Yep, that was it. They were dead. Three of my friends were dead because somebody made a mistake. The trial didn't last long. They don't like mistakes in the Navy. When it was over, there was a girl waiting for Sands out in the corridor. Her name was Myra. Myra Mallory. My sister. Myra, you, you shouldn't have come here. What happened? What did they say in there? Well, I, uh, I'm resigning my commission, Myra. You can't. It's your whole life, Tom. Well, there wasn't any way to clear myself, so there's nothing else for me to do. But it wasn't your fault. No, but it was my responsibility, and in the Navy, that's the only thing that counts. Tom, what are you going to do? Well, I don't know exactly yet, but there's one thing I'm sure of. I'm going to get as far away from the Navy as possible. And what about us, Tom? You and me? Well, Myra, I'm afraid any future we might have had blew up with that gun turret. You mean your career blew up? I didn't fall in love with a commission. I'm not in the Navy. I'm just a nurse who fell in love with a patient. There's no gold braid on a hospital nightgown. I know, I know, Myra. Oh, Tom, why did this have to happen to you? You'd better ask your brother that. I can answer it, too. Yes, I guess you can. Tom, well, wait. Goodbye, Myra. I, I want to talk to you. Tom! No, I'll let him go. He's got a lot to think over. I hope you're satisfied, Mike. If you hadn't testified against him, he wouldn't have had to resign. Now, look. Look, honey, I'd have had to testify against him if he were our own father. Strictly routine. You never did have any use for him, did you? All right, I didn't. I didn't like him the first time I saw him. I liked him less when he started hanging around with you. I know. The old Navy man's prejudice against the enlisted man's sister and the commissioned officer. No, the old Navy man's prejudice against seeing friends dragged out of a turret because some two-striper didn't do his job. He did his job. Oh, come on, sis. Let's not fight over it. It's finished. There's nothing we can do about it. Forget him, honey. I'll never forget him. Well, you might as well. You're not going to be seeing him again. Why not? Because he's busted. He's out of a job. Who's going to give him one? Oh, Mike. Mike, it isn't fair. Oh, come on, darling. I didn't mean to hurt you. Honest, I didn't. Come on. But it's the truth. Come on, dear. Buck up. Here. Here's a handkerchief. Come on, blow. <laughs> Well, like I said, that was in 1940. Right after that, I was sent to the training station in Newport. I was there that Sunday afternoon in December 1941. I remember the president saying, a date that will live in infamy. But all I could think of was a line of beautiful ships burning and sinking and the men I know who went down with them. I called Myra a couple of nights later to say goodbye. I had my orders already, and she'd had hers, too. She'd enlisted with the Naval Reserve as a nurse. Company! Halt! At ease, man. Well, you guys have been yelling for action. Now you're gonna get it. You've drawn a man who also likes plenty of action. Chief Gunner's mate, Mallory. Company! Tension! Here's your gun crew, Mallory. Thanks, bud. All right, at ease. All right, you men are to report to me at Pier 7, Brooklyn. 11.30 tomorrow night. You got that? 
All right, let's get some names here. Come on, I'll talk up. Berenger. Chapter. Judson. Kono. Sand. Davis. All right, hold it. Never mind it now. I'll get him at the pier. You're at liberty until then. Dismissed. Okay. All right. Hey, uh, Sands. Yeah. Just a minute. You want me? Yeah. How'd you get here, Sands? There happens to be a war going on, so I enlisted. It's fine. You got the whole Navy to pick from. Why'd you have to show up in my outfit? Oh, it's just a little matter of obeying orders. Well, take a tip from me and apply for a transfer. Look, Mallory, if you don't want me and your gun crew, it's up to you to get rid of me. That's Navy regulations. Okay, sailor. I'll see you at Pier 7. If it's Navy regulations you want, you're gonna get them. I had a good bunch of boys raring to go. I guess maybe they were hoping for a destroyer, but we drew the Sybil Gray. She was a freighter, small, slow, a little on the rust side. When I was getting the boys aboard that night, they were pretty sad about the whole deal. Bayless reporting. Bayless, get aboard next. Berenger, Chief. Say, we ain't really sailing on this thing, are we? This is your ship, fella. You call this a ship? It ain't fit to be a garbage scow. What'd you expect, a yacht? Well, I figured we'd be rated a cruiser at least. You're reserving those for sailors. Hey, wait a minute, you. You see those boxes they're loading? Yeah. What's it say on them? U.S. Air Corps, ammunition, 50 caliber. Hey! Yeah, hey. Well, that's some of the garbage this guy was carrying. Now, get aboard, next. Go now. Get aboard. Come on, Dutch. Please, not Dutch. How many times have I asked you? Well, you're German, ain't you? I'm not German. I'm American. <laughs> okay, Dutch. Please. Get aboard. Next. Dutson, sir. Never mind us, sir. What? What's that you're carrying there? Oh, uh, well, that's my, uh, that's my radio set. Is it all right? Yes, I guess so. Get aboard. Oh, Chief, my, uh... Well, my mother came down and I, uh... That is... Okay. You can stay on the pier for five minutes. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Go ahead, sailor. Mike! Well, for the love of... Hello, Mike. Hello, sis. I thought we said our goodbyes on the phone. So did I, but I got my orders. I'm shoving off in the morning myself. I wouldn't be surprised if we showed up in the same convoy. Oh, yeah? Oh, well, uh... Fine, I'll uh, wave to you. So long, kid. Mike, you wouldn't be trying to get rid of me, would you? No, 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 but I gotta get on board. I, uh... Mike, are you expecting a blonde? Oh, me? No. Oh. Oh, it's all right, Mike. Uh, I know why you're in such a hurry. What? Tom! Tom Sands! Tom! Hello, Myra. Tom, where have you been all these months? Why didn't you write to me? Well, this new outfit's keeping me kind of busy. You reporting for duty? Sand, Seaman Second, reporting, sir. Get aboard, sailor. Aye, aye, sir. Well, so long, Myra. Goodbye, Tom. Mike, why didn't you tell me? I told you to forget him, didn't I? You still hate him, don't you? Well, I don't love him, that's a cinch. I do, Mike. The Navy gave him the benefit of the doubt. They let him resign and accepted his enlistment. If they can give him a break, you can. He gets the same break as anyone else, no more, no less. It took a lot of courage for him to enlist as a seaman. Or a lot of gall. The men on that turret were my shipmates. One of them was the best friend I ever had. Bye, Myra. Goodbye, Mike. Hey, you guys, how do we divvy up these bunks? Take any one you want, Samter. Only that one's mine, see? Anyone here when we are sailing? Oh, sure, I got a definite. We sail when and if. When they finish loading this and if the engines wake on this tub. Hey, Dustin, what's that contraption you're rigging up? That's a radio. Short now, wave. That thing ain't gonna wake on ship's current. Oh, no? I took care of that. A compensating rheostat for the change in voltage. You fix it yourself, Dudson? Fix it? <laughs> I built it. I've been a radio bug ever since I was a kid. You should have applied for a radio rating. You would be a petty officer. Thanks. But I've got my sights on a commission. Hey, uh, speaking of commissions, uh, this guy Sands we got with us. He used to be a lieutenant. Only the Navy kicked him out. But for... Oh, nothing much. Just letting a bunch of guys get knocked off on a turret on the Bayonne. An ex-officer. I don't think I envy yeah, him. Yeah, from all I hear, he's got a nerve to even show his face around here. Well, I heard that he was... You've got impl- awful good hearing, haven't you, sailor? Yeah. Hello, Sands. Just talking about you. Something nice, I hope? Nope. As a matter of fact, it stunk. Thanks. Well, is it okay with you, Admiral, or do you want to make something out of it? Oh, I guess you've got a right to talk. Yeah, but you ain't giving it to me, sailor. I don't get that idea. Get your gear off that bunk. Why? Because it's my bunk. My gear was in there an hour ago. Yeah? Well, it's out of there starting right now. Now, do you want to make something out of that? I guess I have to, don't I? Oh, I don't know. 
But even a rat will stand up and fight when he's cornered. All right, Berenger. Oh, come on, you guys. Cut it out. What goes on here? Go, Cut it out, will you? Do you hear me? Cut it out. What's the matter here? Oh, uh, just a little... Just a little argument over who gets this bunk. Who had his gear in there first? Well, Sands did, but I tossed it out. Well, toss it back in again. Now, I want to tell you something, and this goes for all of you. All the fighting on this ship will be done topside. Everybody understand that? Yes, sir. Okay, we're shoving off any minute. Now, I know you're all disappointed. You're not on a battle wagon. But this is the hand they dealt us, and we're going to play it out. Well, we ain't kicking, Chief. The only thing is, well, supposing you're out with your sweetie pie, and she wants to see your ship. you got to point out this floating pile of junk. So what? So you tell her, look, honey, that's where I live. So she says, go home, sailor. Go home and burn your clothes. A guy likes a ship he can be proud of. That's so? Well, there's a gun up on deck you can be proud of, and get this. Aft here and above and below, and as far as that gun can toss him, it's all Navy. Forward and midships, it's Merchant Marine, and don't sell those guys short either. It's their job to get this ship across, and it's our job to keep the hineys out of the hair while they're doing it. Now fall in on the gun deck, on the double! Sometime that night, along about 12 o'clock, we slipped out of Brooklyn. Destination, Murmansk. Hey, Dutson, will you turn off that homemade jukebox? I'm trying to get some sleep. Can't you get something besides static, kid? That's not static. That's jumble code. Jungle code? No. <laughs> jumble code. The words are scrambled. Scrambled? Like eggs? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm trying to unscramble them. Been trying to ever since the war started. Well, what's it all about? Well, it's the new way of sending confidential messages. The words are turned back on themselves in the transmitter. And it comes out double talk. <laughs> sure. But somewhere, some guy is receiving this stuff on a special built unscrambler. And it's coming in nice and clear. Then somewhere, some guy is talking it straight, too, huh? <laughs> That's right. As plain as you and me are talking now. Well, who is it? Where's it coming from? <laughs> if I could unscramble it, I'd know. Maybe a base on shore. Maybe a German sub. Now, there's a cheerful little earful. Go to sleep. Sands? Yes, sir. You can go below. I'll take over the watch. Aye, aye, sir. Uh, just a minute, Sands. Now, look, fella, I don't know who started that argument down there, see, and I don't care. But I want to tell you something for your own good. If you want to get along with those men, be one of them. I'll hold up my end. Forget the officer and gentleman stuff, see? Since you brought it up, Mallory, I'll tell you something for your good. In the Navy, you're not an officer because you're a gentleman. You're a gentleman because you're an officer. And you're an officer because you can do any dirt of jar job of work better than any enlisted man on the ship. What so? Who told you that, sailor? Pretty fair sailor by the name of John Paul Jones. Did you ever hear of him? U-boat, 604 calling. U-boat, 604. We have your message. Standing by for Sybil Gray. It's funny how you know sometimes. You're on watch, maybe just at dawn, and you've got your eyes glued to the water. And as far as you see, there's nothing but white caps. But just the same you know, there's something out there. Your fingers itch to grab the speaking tube and yell, Battle stations! But you hold off. They need their sleep down there. And then brought off the port bow, there's a ripple you don't like. And there it is again, and now she breaks water. She's a submarine, and you can right into her gun. Battle stations! Battle stations! Battle stations! Mr. DeMille presents Act Two of The Navy Comes Through, starring Pat O'Brien, Ruth Hussey, and George Murphy. Now, 
Libby Collins has a story for us. It's something I read in a newspaper the other day. Perhaps you saw it too, about a girl who had taken a job in an airplane factory. Her work had to do with one small part of the engine, and she was finding it rather dull, until she found out what that one small part was used for. Without it, the whole engine was useless. Well, that made me stop and think. Isn't it just as true that those of us who are doing our war jobs at home can do them better when we know the reason for them? When we really understand the need for saving. Even doing without some things, well, we don't mind it nearly as much. For instance, did you know it takes the nylon that would go into 186 pairs of stockings to make one medium aircraft tire? Well, Uncle Sam needs aircraft tires a lot more than we need new nylon stockings. We'll get along in what we have, plus a few new rayons and cottons, and do very nicely, thank you. And if you'll take the right kind of care of the stockings you have, you can get along nicely a whole lot longer. Lux them after every wearing. It's been proved, you know, that luxing cuts stocking runs in half. The United States Testing Company, Incorporated, made a whole series of tests on rayon stockings. They washed them over and over in different ways, then tested them on a machine that pulls and strains them the way you do when you wear them. Stockings washed with new, improved Lux Flakes kept so much more of their elasticity, they didn't go into runs nearly as quickly as those rubbed with cake soap or washed with a strong soap. Results showed Luxing cut down runs over 50%. Well, that sounds as though it would pay all of us to stick to Lux Flakes. It does pay, Libby, for all your stockings. Nightly Lux Care cuts way down on runs in silk, nylon, and cotton, as well as in rayon. Be sure to let rayons dry thoroughly. Rayon is temporarily weak when it's wet, you know, and doesn't regain its strength until it's dry all the way through. So don't wear your rayon stockings till 24 to 48 hours after you've luxed them. Get a big box of new, improved Lux tomorrow. You'll find it in the same blue package you know so well. But it's the new Lux the safest, mildest Lux ever made to help you save not only stockings, but all your washables. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of The Navy Comes Through, starring Ruth Hussey as Myra Mallory, Pat O'Brien as Mike Mallory, and George Murphy as Tom Sands. One four-inch naval gun and ten men who don't know when to quit. This is the fighting equipment of a convoy freighter. Now the four-inch gun is blasting away at the steel hide of a German U-boat. Range 3, double O, scale 5 O. Range 3, double O, scale 5 O. Ready, set, fire! All right, all right, boys. Don't get excited. No, don't get excited. Come on, raise the dirty hindies. Get on that gun. Ready, set, fire! Oh. Up 25, scale 5 1. Bayless is hit. He's hit fast. Broner, take over for Bayless. Up 25, scale 5 1. Up 25, scale 5 1. Bayless. Hey, Bayless. He doesn't get back to your station. But he'll bleed to death. Let him bleed. Get on that gun. Ready, set, fire. He won't let me help him. The guy will die. Easy, kid. Easy. Mallory's right. This isn't football, you know. There's no time out for injury. Ready, set, fire. Hey, Chief, they're quitting. Look, they're crash diving. All right, hold your fire, man. Yahoo! They're running. He sure knocked that hiney out of the box. Yeah, you couldn't even hit an umpire with a pop bottle. Get a load of who's really pitching. It's one of our destroyers over there off the bow. Hey, they're dishing us out of that sub. Just when we was getting in the groove. Yeah, one more minute, we could have had them. Don't be handing yourselves any bouquets. If those destroyers hadn't have come up, you'd all be shark bait by now. Why? Because you weren't good enough in the pinch, that's why. The only one who acted like he knew what it was all about was Sands here. As for the rest of you, to put it mildly... Well, I can't put it mildly. What about Bayless? I don't know. They just took him below. Oh, Mallory, the captain wants to see you. Seems that boy of yours was hurt pretty bad. There was nothing much we could do for Bayless. He had a shell fragment in him down deep. It was a job for a surgeon. And that night, we signaled another boat in the convoy. When the surgeon came over the rail in the morning, he had a Navy nurse with him. Hiya, sailor. Well, I might have known you'd show up. I had to come, Mike. Why? Well, it might have been you who was hurt. Yeah, it might have been him, too. Yes, it might have been him. Miss Mallory. 
Coming, sir. I'll be seeing you, Mike. Well, hello. Hello. Now, don't cry, boys. Don't cry. Hey, Chief, who's the dog? Say, she was beautiful, huh? Hey, what's the quickest way to get sick? Now, pipe down, you guys. I've seen her first. Yes, and it's the last time you'll see her on this ship. Oh, oh Chief, have a heart. She's just my type. Well, for your information, she's my sister. Uh, anybody like to play a game, Pinochle? <laughs> All right, get up on the gun deck. We're having a drill. All right. Sands. Yes? Change your station. It's below in the magazine. Till after the medical party leaves, is that yep. it? Till after the medical party leaves. Mr. Mallory, Commander Murray's instructions. Order the boat to return to the hospital ship. For what reason? We can't operate unless, unless this ship lays to. The convoy's proceeding. We're remaining aboard the Sybil Gray. Sybil Gray was on her own for the next few days, about six hours behind the convoy. And then, early one night, the captain ordered her engines stopped. We lay to, drifting in the fog. Silence all ship's bells. No talking. I want absolute quiet. Mike. You better get below, Myra. Why have we stopped? Shh. You know where your lifeboat station is? Yes. What's happened? How's Bayless? He's all right. The doctor's with him. Tell me what's going on. Well, there's a German raider kicking around out there someplace. We can't take any chances. Come on now. Go on back to your cabin. Mike, is this serious? Well, if he spots us, he'll blast us right out of the water. Thanks, Mike. Wait a minute. Where are you going? You know where I'm going. To Tom. Myra, what about Joe O'Connor? Is he out of your life completely? I don't love Joe O'Connor. I've got to see Tom. Now look, sis. He has a job to do. So have you. We may both be dead in five minutes. You can't stop me, Mike. You are the whole U.S. Navy. Well, all right. Wait here. You always were a stubborn little man. Sands, yes. come here. Myra's down at the rail near her cabin. She wants to see you. Is this in line of duty? In a way, yes. Now look, I'm going to tell you something. In case we get out of this alive. There's a fellow back in New York by the name of Joe O'Connor, and he wants to marry Myra. He can give her everything you can't. The only thing that stands between them is you. I guess you've made that clear enough, Mr. Mallory. Back to your watch, Sands. Yes, sir. Well, Mallory, you can stop worrying. 
The opinion that I'm a heel is now unanimous. There are times when a convoy trip is like a 10-day pleasure cruise. And then there are times when you run into grief from the night you up anchor. We'd been shot at from below, now they let us have it from the skies. Machine gun stations! Machine gun stations! All right, get on those guns! Get on those guns! Come on! Come on, men! Myra! Myra, get below! Tom, there's a man hurt here. You hear what I said? Get below! You can't do anything now! Just give me a hand with it! If I can get him under the... Okay, Admiral. That girl has just pinned out of the boat. Keep that gun fired till I get back. Okay, Admiral. Samter? Here. Dutson? Here. Did we do all right, Chief? You don't see any honey planes, do you? No, sir. Croner? Here. Beringer? Beringer's over here, Mallory. Beringer got a pretty bad, Chief. Just one of us. Where's Sands? Sands! Sands isn't here. Well, didn't anybody see him? I didn't. He wasn't at his gun. He was supposed to be with Barringer. He wasn't. Mallory, will you come here a minute? How is he? You can see for yourself. Hey. Hey, Chief. Hiya, Barringer. Oh, I, I, I got one of them. Did, did you see? Sure, I did. Good job, fella. Yeah. Hey, hey look. About, about Sands. I heard you talking. He... Well, he wasn't at the gun, was he? No, I went below. He was... He, he... Easy, son. Don't try to talk. Oh, no, no. No, look, he... he... Here, Sands. Oh. You want me? Yes, I did. A little while ago, we could have used you up here. Oh, what's the matter? You ran out. That's what's the matter. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold it, kid. Why weren't you at your gun? Well, Berenger can tell you that. He was... Ta- Berenger. I'm afraid he can't. He's dead. What were you going to say, Sands? Nothing. You know, Sands, I'd like your alibis better if somebody lived to back them up. I didn't know Myra's been hurt until later. I figured she must have been hit and crawled below where we found her. She was unconscious. But the surgeon said she'd live, and that afternoon we had a service on deck for Berenger. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. Unto Almighty God, we commend the soul of our comrade departed, and we commit his body to the deep, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection and eternal life to our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose coming in glorious majesty to judge the world, the sea shall give up her dead. Amen. I tell you, Chief, I did it. I unscrambled the stuff. Oh, what are you talking about? Instant. What's it on the radio now? He's telling you, Chief, it's German scrambled. Still still yeah, but it's coming in clear. He's They're talking in German right now. What are they saying? Corner, can you Let's translate that stuff? I'm getting it. Uh, wait. They're finished. Well, what is it? There's a submarine supply ship, latitude 60, longitude 1115. Supply ship in these waters? She's flying a British flag. They're carrying torpedoes. Which way is she proceeding? Northwest at 12 knots to meet with subs. Recognition signal, Zieg, by Blinker. Look, Chief, if we went after her, we could intercept her by morning. Yeah. Let's go, Chief. We got her. That's up to the merchant marine. I'll ask the captain. You mean you'll tell him? No, I mean I'll ask him. What's your plan, Mr. Mallory? To sink this supply ship? No, sir. I'd like to take her over as a prize of war. I see. Who will sail her? Well, if you could spare me enough men for a crew. Well, I could let you have a quartermaster. Skeleton crew, but with my second officer dead, there's no navigator I can give you. Oh, no navigator, huh? All right, I'll take you up on that. I haven't agreed yet, Mr. Mallory. You realize this is a very dangerous proceeding? Yes, sir. But taking her over would mean crippling sub-action in these waters for weeks and maybe months. Look here, Mr. Mallory. I've had three ships torpedoed under me already. I've swum in burning oil. I've floated ten days on a raft. I've starved and I've frozen. 
And now what are you asking me to do? Go to war? Yes, sir. I thought I was over draft age. All right. Mr. Reynolds, change course. Head her southwest. Southwest it is, sir. You should have been in the Navy, Captain. Yeah, looks like I am. <laughs> Pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille returns with George Murphy, Ruth Hussey, and Pat O'Brien for Act Three of The Navy Comes Through. Meanwhile, here it is May, and high time you were getting that victory garden of yours planted. Along with your vegetables, plant just as many flowers as you can. That's a suggestion the Department of Agriculture is making to all victory gardeners. For fresh flowers add so much to the beauty of your garden and home, and give a welcome lift to the spirits, too. Now, if you haven't sent for your Lux flower seeds, don't delay. The orders are pouring in by the thousands. And no wonder, this offer is a real bargain. Six big packets of flower seeds for only ten cents and the opening tab from a box of Lux flakes or the wrapper from a cake of Lux toilet soap. Yes, you get six different flower garden favorites for only one dime. Long-stemmed Shirley poppies, tall Cosmos, giant African marigolds, Candy Tuft, Heavenly Blue Morning Glories, and prize-winning Zinnias. You'll have dozens and dozens of plants to fill your garden with color all summer long. Many of them will bloom in window boxes or flower pots, too. They're all first-quality seeds, and every one has been treated with plant hormones to give you bigger, earlier blossoms. They're easy to grow. Simply follow the directions on the back of each packet. Here's how to get your Lux Flower Garden favorites. Take the opening tab from any size box of Lux Flakes... Or the wrapper from one cake of Lux toilet soap. Mail it with 10 cents in coin, no stamps please, to Lux Flower Garden, Box 1, New York City. Lux Flower Garden, Box 1, New York City. Be sure to enclose your own name and address, of course. You can get an order blank from your dealer or just write out your order on a piece of paper. But whatever you do, don't delay. Your seeds should be planted soon and it may take up to three weeks for them to reach you. Remember, for each set of six seed packets you order, send 10 cents in coin and either the opening tab from a box of Lux Flakes or the wrapper from a cake of Lux Toilet Soap to Lux Flower Garden, Box 1, New York City. No stamps, please. This offer expires May 31st and is good only in the United States. Now Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. After the play, you'll meet our stars. And you'll also meet... A lieutenant in the waves. Now the curtain for the third act of The Navy Comes Through, starring Pat O'Brien, Ruth Hussey, and George Murphy. We started the supply ship at dawn. Like Croner had said, she was flying the British flag. That didn't stop us from putting a shot across her bow. Two more in the same place, and she hove two. The British flag came down... And a white one went up in its place. She'd quit without firing a shot. I didn't like it much. I've learned not to trust the Fritzies. I called the men together and gave them the orders for boarding. Then I went below to say goodbye to Myra. I didn't go in, though. The surgeon told me Sam. Sit down, Tom. It was nice of you to come. They told me you asked for me. How are you, Myra? I guess I'll live. Thanks for... Getting me down here. Who told you I did that? No one. But it couldn't have been anyone else. Well, look, uh, I wish you'd forget about it. Forget? Why? Well, just personal reasons. Just don't mention it, huh? All right. You're a funny guy, Tom. Well, Myra, I uh, I better say so long now. I'm I'm on duty. Yes, I I know all about it. The surgeon told me. And look, Tom, I just wanted to tell you something before you go. That that girl you know back on the coast, the one you said... Myra... Well, it's all right, Tom. I've been thinking it all over, lying here. You know what I think, Tom? What? I think there never was a girl out on the coast. Myra, the... 
Goodbye, Tom. Good luck. We boarded the Odin inside an hour. Make fast! Make fast! The captain met me as I came over the rail, handing me his revolver. Well, I can't say I'm pleased to meet you, sir, but we carry a load of high explosives. You caught us by surprise. That was the idea, Captain. What are your orders, please? I'm taking this ship as a prize of war. I imagine you need the tonnage, thanks to our U-boat campaign. And I suppose you want us to go aboard your ship now? That's it. Get your men together. Yes, Tannen! Links on! Boat! Wait a second, wait a second, as you were. Well, Sands, what are you sounding off about? Well, it just occurred to me that this fellow's in an awful hurry to get himself and his men off this ship. Well, so what? Considering we're loaded to the gunnels of torpedoes, I thought it might be a good idea to hold these prisoners aboard just for insurance. I think maybe you got an idea there, Sands. Captain, stick around for a while, huh? Tell your men they're going to stay aboard. Very well. You must not invite us in here, by them. Now tell them we're going to batten them down in the forward hold and keep them there for the rest of the voyage. For the rest of the voyage, they'll be held in the back of the boat. No! 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 All right, Captain, cool off. What's the matter with that man of yours? Here, you, come on, step out, step out, talk up. What is it? Ask him, Croner. What is it, Junge? The torpedo is menert. He says one of the torpedoes has been set to explode. All right. Time to take you and Sands to it. Everybody else stay put. Go on, get going. Come on, you. <laughs> Well, here it is, Mallory. Is that the fuse? I never saw one like that. It's a detonator, the type used in delayed action bombs. How's it work? This half here is filled with nitric acid, and this part's filled with fulminate. When you screw them together tight, the acid eats through the lead and hits the fulminate and sets off the explosive. Are there any more of them? Yeah, there are more fuses, but this is the only torpedo that was set to go off. Well, then we can let their crew board the civil gray. Take care of it, Santa. A pleasure, Chief. Okay, you honey, get over that rail. You know, Sands, uh, you used your head a while ago, but I want to remind you that I'm still giving the orders around here. I'm sorry, I forgot myself. Well, that's okay. Now I got a job for you. I want you to go up on the bridge and navigate us into Belfast. You, uh, you mean you want me to take charge of this ship? That's what I said. Sybil Gray couldn't spare a navigator. Oh, I see. Asking favors, huh? I'm not asking a favor. I'm giving an order. That's a pretty strange order for a CPO to be giving a second-class seaman. Seems to me that's over and above the line of duty. That's a job for a volunteer. All right. Okay, Sands, if it gives you any satisfaction, I'm asking you to volunteer. I'll volunteer, Mallory, but I refuse to sail her to Belfast. What do you mean? This ship is loaded with torpedoes for enemy submarines. I propose we deliver them. Deliver them? With one of these fuses and each consignment. But we can do more damage to the submarine campaign than a whole flotilla destroyer. It's my duty to bring this prize into port. Well, I'll relieve you of that responsibility. I refuse to navigate this ship anywhere except after submarines. I'm still giving the orders. Yes, I know. You said that before. Now, what about the crew? Looks like a volunteer job for them, too. I'll vouch for my crew. You like the idea, then? Yeah, I like it. The only thing I don't like about it is that you thought of it. <laughs> Go on over the bridge to take over. The Civil Gray shoved off to join the Atlantic Patrol. And then we headed the Odin northwest on the same course she'd been before. With Croner doing the talking over the radio, we raised every sub for a hundred miles around. And they started flocking toward us. First was due any minute. I had the boys up on deck giving them some last-minute orders. All right, boys. I've told each of you what your job is. Now, don't rely on your own judgment. You're liable to throw a wrench into the works. All right, Dutch, try him out on that heiny talk. Super fail! Super fail! No murder. It isn't very good, Chief. Now, try that other thing. All together now. Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler. Fooey. Cut it out, Samter. I don't like that Hitler routine. Well, you gotta do a lot of things you don't like to win a war. Try it again. All together. Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! That isn't very good either. No, you're not kidding. You know, the more I think of it, the best thing to do is to keep your mouth shut. Periscope for stern! A periscope! Hey, Mallory, here comes your first customer. There she is right behind us. She's coming up. Get your men set, Mallory. She'll be alongside in a minute. Go ahead, boys. Get to your post. Crono, you do the talking. Don't worry. Sands, you better go up on the bridge. You know, even with that hiney uniform, that Irish kisser of yours won't fool anybody. Speaking of Irish kissers, ask the man who owns one. May I suggest, gentlemen, that neither one of you is exactly the conventional German type. All right, all right. I'll get below. The 
The sub came alongside, and we loaded her with torpedoes, one of them with a surprise package in it. When she was ready to leave, Kroner stood at the rail, giving out with a hiney salute. Heil Hitler! Heil Hitler! The sub shoved off, and then about a half a mile, he blew up into a million pieces. One to nothing, favor us. That night we scored again. And again. It's like shooting fish in a rain barrel. When we had seven of them, we ran out of torpedoes. We turned and headed for Belfast. Sands. Sands, where are you? Up here, on the gun deck. What do you think you're doing? I was just inspecting this magazine flood system. Well, you handle the navigation. I'm still running the gun deck. Well, why don't you run it right, then? That flood valve is frozen. I'll run it right. Let me at that thing. <clears throat> hey, it is frozen, isn't it? I thought those square heads were supposed to be so efficient. Anybody can make a mistake. Yeah, once. Oh, Croner. Yes? Check that overflow pipe. I did. Is it working? It's working. All right. Don't forget to secure that door when you go out. Well, what are you waiting for? Why are you trying to make the crew hate you more each day? What the crew thinks about me doesn't make any particular difference. If you would only make an effort. Look, Croner, it's only when you're guilty that you have to make an effort to prove your innocence. And uh, don't forget to secure that door. <laughs> It's getting boring, that's all I say. Pipe down, Samter. Now, nah, look at us. All that fun with those subs, and now we're sitting around doing nothing. It's getting boring, that's all. That nuts who flew over us this morning broke the monotony a little. So what did he do? Not a thing. He thought we were German, that's why. I wonder if he did. What do you mean, Kroner? I tried to speak to him on the radio. He wouldn't answer. What? What? You You mean he might have been wise to us? Who knows? Periscope off the port bow! Hey! Listen, you guys, watch the periscope, will you? All right, boys, on the job. Get moving. You'll be coming alongside. But we have no more torpedoes. You tell him that, Croner. Get rid of him as quick as you can. There he is. See him? Never mind that gab. Get ready to go into your act. Come on. Mallory. Yeah, what? He's changing his course. They're topside men in the gun. Battle stations. Battle stations. You merchant marine men, get below. Get below nothing. We want to get in this scrap. Hard aboard. port. Aye, aye, sir. Full speed ahead. Full speed ahead. Come on, you men. Come on. Good to ready. All right, let's go. Range 3, scale 5 -0. Range 3, scale 5 -0. Ready. Set. Fire. No chains. Load. No chains. Load. Load. Ready. Set. Fire. No chains. Load. Load. Ready. Set. Fire. Holy. Hey, Mallory. There's another customer to starboard. Okay, I see him. Swingers, turn around. Right, Ready. Set. Fire. Nice going, boys. Nice going. Keep up that rhythm. Ready. Set. Fire. Going, keep it going. Chief, the powder magazine, there's fire in there. All right, turn on the flood valve. I can't, it's frozen. What do you mean, it's frozen? I tell you, Chief, it's frozen. All right, there's another valve inside the powder magazine. I'll go down and see if that was working. Wait, Chief, you can't go down All there. All right, take over, Croner. I'll be right back. Load, ready, set, fire. The inside of that magazine was thick with smoke. I tried to find the valve, but it flooded the place with water, and then I guess the smoke got me. I couldn't reach the valve. I couldn't even get out of the place. I went down on my knees, choking. The last thing I remember was a fellow coming down the ladder and groping his way toward me through the smoke. He got to the valve and turned it on. He got me out of there, too. Don't ask me how, I wouldn't. The fellow's name was Tom Sands. The boys got those subs. Yep, both of them. When we could finally get our breath again, we lined up on the aft rail to take count of the wounded. The Navy and the Merchant Marine, too. Hey, you Navy guys! Nice pitching in there! Nice pitching yourself, men! All right, boys, get a load of some real sailors. I guess I knew what I was talking about when I told you not to sell the Merchant Marine short. All right, clear your wounded. Crona, you were hit, weren't you? Well, you don't have to help. I'm all right, Chief. I'd like to help. Okay. Nice going, Dutch. Oh, I'm not Dutch. I'm an American. Yep. And I don't think anybody will ever question that fellow. Oh, uh, Sands. Yes, sir? Well, you certainly saved my hide. 
As a matter of fact, all of our hides. If you'd have done your job right, it wouldn't have been necessary for either one of us to get down to that magazine. I did my job right. Board of Inquiry wouldn't think so. What? They'd want to know why that valve didn't work. Well, I could tell them. I fixed it myself yesterday. Then how do you account for the fact that it wouldn't work when the magazine caught on fire? Well, I can't account for it. I had the same trouble once myself in a gun turret. Remember? On the Bayonne? Yeah, the Bayonne. That's right. Well, I guess if you could take it, so can I. You won't have to, Mallory. It just happens I know you repaired that valve, and I'm alive to tell them. Say... Wait a minute, sailor. You know, I can't figure how a guy with guts enough to go down in that magazine... Yeah, I know what it is you want to know. Why I ran away from my gun that day, huh? That's exactly what I want to know. Well, why don't you ask your sister? We were picked up that night by the North Atlantic Patrol, and a month later we were back in the USA in Washington. The court of inquiry is reconvened in the case of Thomas L. Sands. Oh, they cleared him pretty fast. When we were both set up to Newport, to go with another outfit. Hello, Lieutenant. Hello, Myra. I came to see you off, Tom. Your gold braid's beautiful. So are you. Oh, by the way, that girl out on the coast... Yeah? I spoke to her. She married a Marine. No, oh, fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I can go right on chasing you, can't I? You want to know something? You won't have to run very fast. <laughs> Company, ho! All right. All right, men. Now, you joined the Navy to see action, and you're going to get it. You're going to serve under a man who likes plenty of action. I know because I've seen plenty of it with him. Lieutenant Thomas L. Sands. All right. Come on, leave! Not a bad-looking outfit we've got here, Chief. Well, they're all right. They got plenty to learn the hard way. Oh, you wouldn't admit it if they were perfect. Of course not. What do you want me to do, spoil them? Well, they'll learn all right, and a lot more like them. And when they get rolling, they're going to be a tough outfit to stop. Awful tough. You know, there was a pretty fair sailor once by the name of John Paul Jones... He said... Yeah, yeah, I know. We've just begun to fight. Before our stars return to the microphone, listen a minute. This message is for you. In your kitchen, you've got part of what it takes to fire those guns, to drop those bombs on Berlin or Tokyo. Your waste kitchen fats contain glycerin, one of the things needed to make explosives and other materials of war. Now, it's not a romantic job to collect waste kitchen fat, but every bit you turn into your meat dealer is important. Every tablespoonful counts. If you save a tablespoonful a day, it amounts to a pound a month, enough to make nearly a pound and a half of smokeless powder. Save every bit of fat. Use what you can, of course. Strain it. Reuse it. Only after it's done its job for you should you turn it in for salvage. Then, strain it into a clean can. Any kind of a fruit or vegetable or soup can will do. Don't use paper or glass containers because they leak or break. The cans you turn in will be salvaged as well as the fats. When the can is full, take it to your meat dealer promptly. He'll pay you cash for every pound. And within 21 days, that fat will be going into gunpowder or other war materials. Remember, no amount is too small to count. Save every bit and turn it in promptly. This is an everyday war job for every home in America. Now here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. The Navy always comes through, and so do players like Ruth Hussey, Pat O'Brien, and George Murphy. It's curtain call time right now. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. It was a privilege to have a part in this inspiring story of the Navy gun crews. And it was swell of you, Ruth, to step in at the last minute. You did a grand job. I was delighted to do it for Joan Bennett and Mr. DeMille and everyone here. I know Joan will be all right in a day or two. Well, we all hope so, Ruth. Uh, Pat, how about a little news on your jaunt overseas? You've seen some of the Navy firsthand while you've been entertaining soldiers and sailors. Yes, I made the whole trip around the Caribbean by air, C.B., didn't set foot on a boat for the whole 11,000 miles, except for a couple of trips up the river into the jungle. I don't think we missed flying in any crate down there that had wings. Giving up that trip was a big bit disappointment to me, Pat. 
I guess I missed some exciting times. Pretty rugged country down there, isn't it? Yes, it is. And those boys are in some pretty lonely places. We put on 75 shows from Puerto Rico straight on into Dutch Guiana, and I want to do it all over again. And I'll be with you this time if I don't get out before that, Pat. George, I've asked a member of a rather new branch of the Navy to come here tonight and tell us something about it. She's the daughter of Irene Rich. She's been a very good friend of mine for some years. But first, let me tell you about next week's play. What is it to be, Mr. DeMille? Uh, Ruth, it's one of the great love stories the screen has brought us this year. Warner Brothers' distinguished dramatic success, Now Voyager. And our stars will be Ida Lupino and Paul Henry. The picture has played to packed houses all over the country. And next Monday, we'll bring you this powerful story of a woman's sacrifice for love with Ida Lupino and Hollywood's newest sensation, Paul Henry. That was a very fine picture, C.B. It's a cinch. Your audience is going to love it. Now, I'd like to have you all meet Irene Rich's daughter, Lieutenant Francis Rich of the Waves. Good evening, and thank you, Uncle Cecil. I've enjoyed tonight's play immensely. Uncle Cecil, huh? Hmm, you didn't tell us about that, C.B. Well, he isn't really my uncle, Mr. Murphy, but I've always called him that. I went to school with his daughters. As a matter of fact, George, I'm the proud owner of the first piece of sculpture that Frances ever made, long before she acquired a national reputation as an artist. <laughs> Thanks for those kind words. After the war, I hope to go back to my trade. But I have another job now, and I think Pat O'Brien can help me out a little. Say the word, Lieutenant. Well, when you visited those Caribbean bases, were the boys getting the news from home? Well, most of them were, thanks to V-mail. Well, the amount of mail that must go overseas to our armed forces has presented a terrific problem to the Army and Navy. V-mail is the way of photographing letters on very small film, isn't it? Yes, it is, and it saves valuable cargo spaces on ships and planes. V-mail has priority over all other mail, and it's always sent by air. We hope to persuade everyone to use it when riding overseas, and any stationery store has V-mail letter paper. I'd like to know a little more about your branch of the service, Lieutenant, the waves. Well, any woman may join, Miss Hussey, who, has a, who is a citizen between the ages of 20 and 50 and doesn't have children under 18. Well, just what Navy jobs have the waves taken over, Francis? I, I mean, Lieutenant. <laughs> well, it would take me from now until 2400 to tell you all of them. Pardon but... me, but what's 2400? Well, that's midnight in the Navy, Miss Hussey. You know, every wave releases a man for our fighting ships. They're learning to operate the control towers at Navy airfields. You'll find them working as machinists, metal workers, radio operators, meteorologists, photographers, and dozens of other jobs... All interesting. In brief, I take it that you think very well of the waves. <laughs> well, how else can a girl think when each new day is really more interesting than the last? Well, may I thank you all, and good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Best of luck to the waves, Francis. <laughs> Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Ida Lupino and Paul Henry in Now Voyager. This is Cecil B. DeBell saying good night to you from Hollywood. Ruth Hussey will soon be seen in the Paramount picture, The Uninvited. Heard in tonight's play were George Sorrell as Croner, Eddie Marr as Samter, Edwin Mills as Dutson, Warren Ash as Berenger, and Griff Barnett, Charles Seal, Harry Fleischman, Fred Mackay, Noel Madison, Norman Field, and Leo Cleary. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in next Monday night to hear Ida Lupino and Paul Henry in Now Voyager. Today you can't afford to be tired or nervous because of a diet low in vitamins. Yet with food rationing and shortages, it's harder to get vitamin-rich foods. So take VIMS. VIMS are scientifically designed to help make meals complete. VIMS give you all the vitamins government experts say are essential, balanced in the formula doctors endorse. And VIMS supply all the minerals commonly lacking. Get VIMS at druggists. VI for vitamins, double MS for minerals. VIMS. 
This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.